put on your strength, oh Zion, put on your beautiful garments, oh Jerusalem, the holy city, shake off the dust and arise. This year we're going through the book of Romans, and we covered the first seven verses last week, so we're in lesson two, and we're going to start with verse eight, and it says this, first I thank my God through Yeshua the Messiah for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. Now this is a fairly standard greeting for Paul very similar to his other letters, except for that these Romans, he takes it a step further and he says, I thank God through Yeshua the Messiah. In other words, he's revealing to us and to them the Messiah Yeshua's ministry as mediator of this new covenant. You know, you often hear people say, well, you should only pray to the Father. Well, Paul does not concur with that. He makes it evident to the Romans that his prayer and thanksgiving are offered through the Messiah Yeshua because he is the mediator of the new covenant. And through him and because of him, we have direct access to the throne of God. The best example of this is Moses. You didn't just pass by Moses and go into the tent of meeting to speak with God, at least if you wanted to live. You went to Moses and inquired of God through Moses. Well, Paul is telling us much the same thing of Messiah Yeshua. He has the ministry of mediator of the covenant. You see, there's no access to the throne of God except through the Messiah Yeshua. And if we are in him, then through him... We have access. We often get hung up on these issues, but let me tell you what I've found. It's not your words, it's your heart. Is your heart in the right place? If it is, then God will hear you. You know, I'm going to tell you something. People pray to Jesus. They pray to Yeshua. They pray to the Father. They pray, Lord, and they all get their prayers and answers the same. It's the heart not the words. You know, last week we read through the attributes of God as part of the festival reading, and I did some commentary on them. Well, I read things like merciful, patient, long-suffering, kindness, and so forth. I don't remember reading anything like picky, petty, or unresponsive. Now, I want you to, to show you how big God is. Let me tell you, let me look at how he, what he calls his son. Listen to this, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his Government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing it, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. He's not concerned with what you call him or what you call Yeshua. He's just concerned that you do call him. So go home tonight, get into your prayer closet and give him a call. No matter if you pray Yeshua or Father or Lord or Adonai, I guarantee you, he'll answer. Okay, so much for the rabbit trail, but I hate that kind of legalism. It's upsetting to me because the real point is it's a matter of heart. Yeshua is our mediator, and through him and because of him, we have access to the Father. Now, the next thing I want to bring to your attention is he says, your faith is being reported all over the world. What does he mean by that? How can one's faith be reported? Well, we only have to look at a verse we looked at last week. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
And so if their faith is being reported, the Romans must have been busy with their good works. Spreading the word. The only way faith can be made known and reported is if they were exhibiting good works. Because this is what James says in chapter 2, verse 18. He says, show me your faith without deeds. I'll show you my faith by what I do. You see, there's no way you can show me your faith unless you do something. You can't even show me that you're alive unless you do something. And if you don't do anything long enough, they bury you. (laughs) The Romans were more than likely preaching the good news, at least as they understood it. And I'll explain more about that later. They're witnessing the Messiah Yeshua to those around them, not just with their words, though, but with their good deeds. And so right away, I have to ask myself, and everybody else should be asking themselves, with these glowing words about their faith, you have to ask yourself, why did Paul write this letter to these Romans? Because if you read Paul's letters, usually his letters are reserved for those who are having a problem. The best example of this is his letter to the Galatians. Their faith is being tested. And so he begins the letter with, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Messiah and turning to a different gospel. They're being told they need to become Jewish in a traditional manner to be saved. Become part of Israel in the traditional manner of the rabbis in order to be saved. Now, while the other letters don't begin so drastically and plainly, still, if you read them, it's apparent that he's addressing some problem in that community. But not so much as we read this letter from Rome. In Rome, they're doing good works. The faith requires. Those things that are spoken of in verses 5 and 6 that we looked at last week, more plainly stated in Ephesians, John, and James. So unlike the rest of Paul's letters, when you start to read this, it would seem that he addresses no serious problems at all. He praises them, and that praise will remain throughout the letter. And so you ask yourself, well, why would he write this amazing letter? With the most complete rendering of our justification, sanctification, and obligations, the good news. Well, I'll let you dwell on that for a while, because... Paul is going to tell us in this first chapter in just a few verses. But let me say, they have a serious problem. It's just not so plainly stated. Let's read on in verse 10. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit, in the good news of his Son, how unceasingly I make mention of you in my prayers at all times, and I pray... that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. Now, what I want you to see here is it says, God whom I serve in my spirit. The word serve here is is a Greek word that can mean serve or worship. It's the equivalent to the Hebrew avodah. The avodah of the temple was the temple worship but it was also the service of the priests. The key here is with my spirit. Let me tell you something. We are spiritual beings. We have spirits that transcend this life. Our bodies have a limited amount of time that they're going to live, and then they wear out. But our spirit will live on, and that's why the Bible speaks of eternal life and eternal punishment. Well, Paul says, I serve God with my spirit. We're to serve God with our spirits. We're to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Listen to what John says. In chapter 4, verse 22, he says, Yeshua says this, Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Well, Paul is telling us that he serves God in spirit, with his spirit. 
He desires that we serve Him spiritually. You see, when our spirits are devoted to serving, we're going to live a life that reflects the love of God and our love for our fellow man. We become walking examples of the good news. And Paul is telling us that we not only have an obligation to do good works in our natural lives by helping those in need and so forth, but the other part of this calling that we have is to be spiritual beings who commune with God. We're to be people of prayer. And he's telling us, if we have ears to hear, that one really relies on the other. When our spirit, when we're serving God in spirit and communing with God and being controlled by His Spirit, we're worshiping and serving in spirit and in truth. You know, it's possible to serve God and follow His commands in the physical out of habit. It's possible to serve Him in spirit and truth. It's possible to serve God in this life, read the scriptures, do good works in his name, and yet go through this life and never know Yeshua. Never commune with Yeshua. As an example, you could spend your life studying and reading the word, pouring over commentaries, reading everything you can lay your hands on, and in the end you'll become a Torah scholar. You can end up knowing the Torah, the Tanakh, and the new covenant, Scriptures, word for word, by heart. If you study hard enough. But if your prayer closet isn't next to your study, if you don't go into the prayer closet and share your burdens with God and allow Him to share His with you, if you don't allow Him to break your heart so that you need to go out and tell others of the good news, if you look at the lost in the world and it doesn't break your heart as it breaks his, if the words of Scripture don't get you out of your seat, then you're not serving in spirit and truth. The Spirit and the Word of God should motivate you. And if they don't, hey, you're missing something. Let me tell you, you hear of intercessors in their prayer closets, weeping and groaning uncontrollably. Well, God is breaking their hearts. They're sharing in His burden for the world, and it's overwhelming. Listen to what Paul says in chapter 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans, that words can express. And he searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saint in accordance with God's will. Now listen to what he says in chapter 9. In verse 1, he says, I speak the truth in Messiah. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Messiah for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the, the people of Israel. Those aren't metaphors, folks. This is the spirit part of the spirit and truth. This is the way Yeshua lived and worshipped. When he was in the garden and he was in intercession for the world, he was in anguish and weeping. It's one thing to know that the world is corrupt and full of sin by reading of it in the scriptures. And it's another thing to lie weeping and groaning in your prayer closet because the Spirit of God has broken your heart over it. We're not just the people of study, but we need to be a people of prayer. A people who commune with Yeshua. And John records this for us. The words of Yeshua again. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sh sheep. And I have sheep that are not of this pen that I must bring also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. 
they too will listen to my voice. That's not a metaphor, folks. Yeshua literally means his sheep will know his voice. They're going to take the time to come to know him. Not just to know about him as you read about him in the scriptures. Not just to know about him. James says even the demons know about him and tremble. But to know him is another matter. And that's only done through prayer. To know him means that you know what his burdens are. God is burdened by the people not yet turned to him. And that burden is crushing. Paul says, I serve in my spirit. And then he tells us how. He says, I pray unceasingly. He tells us that is part of the good news of Yeshua. We actually become co-laborers. It's only through the good news of Yeshua and our acceptance of Yeshua that we're able to have this relationship. It's only through accepting the good news of Yeshua that relationship with Him is possible. Without that, you don't have this type of access. He goes on in verse 11 to say, I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. You know, I've pondered this letter many times hard and I've looked at the words and the intent of the letter and tried to couple it with some history that I know and I've come to some conclusions. First of all, conclusion is this. To the best of anyone's knowledge, this congregation in Rome was not begun by an apostle. Not by Peter, not by Paul, because as the letter reveals to this point, he hasn't even been there yet. But if we go to the book of Acts, I think we can help solve what he means here by looking at what happened to Philip and the Samaritans, those he preached to in Samaria, and the Samarian, Samaritans that believed. Listen to what Acts chapter 8 and verse 5 says. Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip, and saw the miraculous signs that he did, they all paid close attention to what he said, and with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, many paralytics and many cripples were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Peter, on hearing of the success of Philip, went and laid hands on the new believers and imparted the Holy Spirit to him. We read that in verse 14. It says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had been baptized in the, to the name of the Lord Yeshua. And when Peter and John placed their hands on them, they received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The spiritual gift that was imparted to these Sumerians was the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul worded his verse like this. He says, I long to render a spiritual gift to make you strong. And the word for spiritual there is charisma. Listen to what it is. I put the definition up here. Grace or gifts denoting extraordinary powers, distinguishing certain Christians and enabling them to serve the church of Messiah, the reception of which is due to the power of the divine grace operating on their souls by the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't necessarily agree 100% with that definition, but you get the idea. I am of the belief that while the congregations in Rome knew of Yeshua and had been baptized in water, they had not yet received the spiritual gifts. They were not yet empowered by the Spirit of God, just as the Samaritans. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he speaks in detail of the charisma, the charismata, the empowering of the Spirit of God for the purpose of ministry, but he doesn't go into that in the book of Romans. Perhaps that's what he would like to impart when he arrived, the laying on of hands. So I believe that this is what is meant. I believe that verses 14 and 15, though, are going to tell us something else and give us a whole lot further insight into why he wants to go to Rome. 
But before we get to verses 14 and 15, we first have to read verse 13. So, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that I had planned to come to you many times, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. Paul wants them to know that while he has not come to them, it wasn't because he didn't have a desire. He's longed to go to them to impart this spiritual gift. And notice he says he wants to have a harvest among you. And I want you to keep that on a back burner as we read 14 and 15. Because again, I think these verses are key. It says in 14, I am obligated to both Greeks and non-Greeks, to both wise and foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. These folks, while they may have had the good news preached to them and are of a faith in Messiah Yeshua that's manifested in their good works, he still wants to preach the good news to them. Why would that be? Well, obviously, there must be some part of the good news that they haven't heard or understood. It would seem that their understanding of the good news is lacking in its scope. And Paul is letting, telling them that he has longed to come to them to preach and teach the good news and all that it affords. Now listen to what else he says. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it, because it is the power of of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Here's what I'm reading in this first chapter. Folks, these folks have heard about Yeshua and believed, and in some way they show their faith with these outward manifestations in their life. They're doing good works. However, the complete gospel has not been preached to them. And I want to tell you something. There's nothing new under the sun because the whole gospel isn't preached to this day. And the reason is because we fail to understand the fullness of the gospel. Our gospel, the gospel we preach, is not complete. And we can see that in the word salvation that he uses. He uses the word soteria, and it means this. Rescue safety, physically or morally, deliver health, salvation, save and saving. It says physically or morally, but let me tell you, in the case of Messiah's good news, it should read physically, morally, and eternally. And I also want you to know the root word for this is the root word that we translate save. It's sozo in the Greek. It means this, heal, preserve, save, do well, make whole. What I want you to see, it says, heal and make whole. The good news of Yeshua is meant to heal your spirit, your body, to make you whole and to preserve you and seal you by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. God wants to make you whole physically and spiritually. Hey, there's a problem in Rome, all right. The problem is they don't understand. They have not been told just what the good news truly is all about. And Paul longed to go to them and impart a spiritual gift and to speak to them about what the good news is all about. Look at what, ha I want you to see what happens when the good news is preached. Acts chapter 5 and verse 16 says, Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those who tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Let's read about what happened in Samaria again. Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. And with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. And there was great joy in the city. 
Let me tell you something. When the gospel is preached, people are completely sozo. Listen again. I want to listen. This is a little lengthier passage here, but it's worth it. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 says, Then Peter began to speak. Now I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him, who reverence him, and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling them the good news of peace through the Messiah, Yeshua, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened in, throughout Judea, beginning in the Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Yeshua of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We're witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. By us, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, he commanded us to preach to the people to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. When the whole of the good news is preached, there's sozo. When the whole of the gospel is preached, people are healed spiritually, physically, and filled with the Spirit of God and empowered by the Spirit of God. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the good news. Listen, if you're ashamed of the good news, you're not really of a faith of Messiah Yeshua. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. He says, so do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as a prisoner, but join with me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to this holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace was given us in Messiah Yeshua before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Messiah Yeshua, who has destroyed death and, brought, and has brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. And this, of this gospel, I was appointed as a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am, yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have trusted to him for that day. Listen, the gospel of Yeshua destroyed death and brought life and immortality, and the key word here is and. Folks, we need to get back to preaching the whole of the good news, unashamedly. I'm going to tell you, I've said this before, but I thank God that I didn't hear the good news that most preached, that most preached today. I had, I had not heard it. And so I cried out to Yeshua by myself one day in my sickness and in my addiction. And I said, Lord, I need your help. I've made a mess of my life. I need you to go on. And I woke up the next morning sozo. Yeah. Yeah. Healed and set free. I just believed that Jesus could sozo. Because no one had told me any different. No one had told me a watered down version of the good news. So I didn't know anything else. I believed God for the whole banana. And thank God for that. 
The good news is wholeness, set free and delivered so that you can be a walking testimony for Yeshua and the love of God. But let me also say, that's not what's preached today. You see, sickness is the result of sin. Death is the result of sin. Demon possession is the result of sin. And the good news is your sins are forgiven and the effects are reversed. The good news is the power of God in your life and communing with God once again. And notice what he says. He says, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. In other words, God isn't done with Israel, folks. You read the book of Revelation and and Jewish people come to the Lord by the millions. And as I stated last week, Paul will devote three chapters of this letter to that. And the reason is simple. If we're going to trust God for our salvation, we have to see that God is going to deal lovely, lovingly with His covenant people Israel as well. Yeah. Amen? If we don't understand that God's ultimate purpose is to redeem Israel, how can we ever accept that He would redeem non-Jews, pagans, and barbarians who never gave Him a thought? Yeah. Well, sadly... The Roman church who this letter is addressed to didn't really get the message because that's exactly what they preached over the centuries that God was done with the Jewish people. I believe also that true faith in Messiah and the good news is a faith that's founded on the knowledge of God and the good news will instill in the believers of that good news a love for the people of Israel. They're Yeshua's brothers. Anti-Semitism in Christians is brought about by ignorance of the good news. The Jews didn't kill Christ. I did. You did. You did. Y'all did. Because nobody took his life. He gave it. I hear some say, well, we shouldn't go preach to the Jewish people as they live more Torah-observant lives than we do. And we shouldn't preach the good news to the Jewish people because they'll be offended. Well, let me say something. Go to any sinner in the world. I don't care what nationality is. Preach the good news. They're going to be offended. (laughs) So what makes the Jewish people any different? (laughs) You know, the most anti-Semitic thing I've ever heard is that we should not go preach to the Jewish people. But just help them in the natural. We shouldn't preach to the Jewish people because they have their own covenant. I seriously believe that those who advocate the dual covenant or wit- not witnessing to the Jewish people because it's better to be their friend are ashamed of the good news. That's what I believe. Well, I'm like Shaul. I'm not ashamed of the good news because I too know that it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Key word, everyone. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. He goes on in verse 17 and he says this. For in the gospel a righteousness is revealed from God, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And we're going to pick up here next week because I don't have time to go into this. Is, this is a monumental verse here, so we don't have time for this today. But I do want to close with this. There's really nothing new under the sun. Because as I thought about the church in Rome today, they have the same problem that I just described. They preach the most incomplete version of the good news I've ever heard. Jesus died for your sins Become a member of the Catholic Church and you'll be saved. Like the Rome Paul is writing to, the Church of Rome all over the world is known for its good deeds and its charity. Catholic charities, all these charities. My mom, after after her husband died, went to Catholic Church for a while and she was just amazed by the outpouring of love and, and good deeds and help that she got from the people in the Catholic Church. They're known for their good deeds. They're renowned for that. And yet, 
they do not understand the good news as is brought forth in Scripture. So much so, it makes me wonder if they ever got the letter. Of course, we know they did get the letter, but it still makes me wonder. For sure, they didn't understand the letter. They didn't understand to the Jew first and then to the heathen. That's evident by their persecution of the Jewish people. Because in this letter, Paul gives the most succinct, complete version of the good news in the Bible, and yet they missed it. And they've been reading it longer than anybody. Well, as we study, let us not miss it. Amen. Hallelujah.